Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Keeping the World Company. We're going to talk about Ukraine, Europe, and authoritarianism. What can we learn here in the U.S., and could authoritarianism happen here? For this discussion, uh, we have Gene Rosenfeld, my co-host, Tim Apicella, Manfred Henningsen. Uh, Gene is a retired history and religion professor from UCLA. Uh, Manfred Henningsen is a retired political science professor uh, from UH Manoa. Let me start with you, Gene. Uh, can you give us a, a precis of this very interesting interview uh, that Bill Crystal did of Ann Applebaum on YouTube a few days ago? Well, Ann Applebaum has a new book coming out called Autocracy Incorporated, and she was on the show with Bill Crystal to elaborate on some of her ideas in that book, which uh, uh, do apply particularly to Europe and to the recent elections for the European Union Parliament, um, which 27 free countries participated in and uh, had a tendency to uh, highlight some of the gains of some of the parties in some of the countries that are extreme right. Uh, they would be the analogs to MAGA here. And uh, for the most part, they are um, uh, isolationist, as is the MAGA party here. Um, she did comment during her long interview that Donald Trump is probably more extreme and his movement is more extreme than some of the movements in Europe. Although the alternative for uh, Germany, which is gaining um, among voters there, uh, is an extreme far right movement that has infiltrated their military, as a matter of fact. But they don't have the numbers yet to really be a threat to um, Schultz. And uh, but they did show up in the uh, in the in, in the votes for the European Parliament. Overall, what came out of this vote was that the president of France, Emmanuel Macron decided to call snap elections, which the president can do in France, to see as kind of a referendum where the French people were on the far right versus his center right coalition. And if he can get some kind of a, a mandate in the midst of all this before Trump comes, <laughs> comes into the picture, possibly, uh, they're very concerned about that. And uh, so we will see what happens in France, because the right wing party there has been in, in extreme right, has been in uh, contention and has been growing. It's about 30 percent now, I think, of the vote. And uh, it started out very fascist, very uh, anti-Semitic. And uh, through the founder's uh, daughter has become more moderate. The other uh, primary fascist party in Europe is uh that of the head of state in uh, Italy. It's a descendant of Mussolini's fascist party, but she so far has been keeping a more moderate profile and is supporting Ukraine. So all in all, it's, it's kind of like Europe is in a stalemate um, and you can't really say that authoritarianism is growing or that it is declining. And I still feel that the main um, emphasis and and uh, fulcrum for authoritarianism among the Western countries and democracies is going to be what happens in our election here and how the other countries have to respond to that. Well, we had uh, a discussion uh, of similar points last time. So, um, Manfred, can you weigh in on this? Can you let us know your reactions to the and Applebaum interview on YouTube. I agree with uh, her. The thrust of her reading of European politics, which is not apocalyptic, um, and she emphasizes, uh, you know, how the right wing parties, for example, have lost votes in Scandinavia, all Scandinavian countries. Uh, she points out uh, that Orban is in trouble in Hungary, uh, and uh, she does not overemphasize the future of the FD in Germany as well. 
And I agree with that. Uh, I mean, we have to talk about uh, a divided Germany, mentally divided Germany, uh, the East 10 part, the five former uh, GDR states, and the West. And I wouldn't be surprised if the AfD becomes, uh, collapses, you know, for all kinds of internal uh, problems. But you see, one aspect that one has to really talk about when speaking about this uh, issue, that Americans are so focused on what may happen in Europe that they forget that they have a semi-fascist past as well. And they don't want to talk about it. They are in, unable. I mean, Robert Kagan has just published a book, Anti-Liberalism, which makes it quite clear that what we see today in, in the uh, Trump uh, movement, a recurrence of what happened you know, in the 20s. Uh, and, uh, you know, you have, uh, I mean, that interview that he gave, you know, after the Applebaum interview is absolutely stunning. Uh, but uh, for some strange reason, Americans, even the in informed, politically informed Americans are ignorant of their own history. They don't confront their history uh, critically. I mean, the white supremacy uh, thrust that you have today uh, is not, uh, you know, something that happened overnight. No, it has been there for uh, all post-Civil War, American post-Civil War history. Uh, this white racism becomes always activated by immigrant, immigrants from, well, in the, in the 19th century, in the late 19th century, from Mediterranean uh, immigrants, from Eastern European, especially Jewish immigrants. And then you have, uh, you know, the resentment of Asian immigrants. You have the uh, curtailing of uh, the immigration in, in 1925. And that last, you know, this uh, white supremacist mentality that influenced immigration into the United States last until the 60s. Particularly the younger people um, in, in Europe are more aware, better educated about these issues and histories um, than in the US. Are you saying that they're- Yes and no, yes and no. I think to some extent they are more uh, uh, educated, but uh, when you look at the, behavior of the political behavior of the uh, young in Germany, it's quite interesting, you know, that they have not been supporting the Greens, despite this really powerful youth movement that you had in, uh, in Germany. They have been, they have not gone to the AfD, they have supported all kinds of uh, populist uh, one issue parties. And that may be, as I, you know, am afraid of may happen in the United States in November, you know, they may go for Cornel West and, uh, and Robert Kennedy, uh, the young voters. So in that sense, uh, I don't know about uh, what will happen in France, whether the young, we will know by the beginning of July, uh, what will happen. Now, Mac Macron can continue to, to govern until 27 when he has to re uh, leave office. Uh, he cannot uh, become uh, re-elected. Uh, so we have to wait uh, what happens, as we will have to wait what happens in Great Britain. You know, We know now there's a certain amount of flexibility. I mean, uh, and, and Applebaum says there are some of these uh, right-wing people in uh, in Europe, who have moderated their rhetoric, um, you know, maybe less anti-Semitic. Some, Meloni especially. Yeah, and so, uh, you know, that it's not just a one-way street. So, Tim, I want to ask you about this. What, what you have is a certain mm, phenomenon, a certain dynamic uh, in Europe, and maybe there are aspects of it that tell us that you could still have a civil society, even if your politics move to a certain degree to the right. Um, and uh, on the other hand, I think we all agree that what's happening here 
is perhaps more threatening uh, than what is happening in many places in Europe. But because um, people here are moving far to the right, they're they're following cult figures, um, and they're taking positions that are really way over there. So the question is. Assuming Donald Trump or people like Donald Trump take power, uh, can we learn to live with it um, the way uh, Europe is learning to live with it? Can we move right and still have a civil society? Of course. England does it all the time. The, the Conservative <laughs> Party versus the Labour Party. They do it all the time, back and forth. Um, you know, the issue is a, a conservative movement versus an authoritative movement. And uh, speaking of Ann Applebaum, she, you know, just before this program, uh, she was on CNN. And um, I believe that she's correct when she says the alignment of certain powers, authoritative powers, i.e. leaders, is starting to solidify. And that, uh, that solidification is, is primarily due to two things. One is um, an alignment of those nations that are the recipient of sanctions. And the second is uh, try to align those countries, those leaders that are opposed to Western ideology. And um, we could say the catalyst for the solidification of, of these authoritative countries is primarily due to the war in Ukraine. Putin needs weapons, he needs ammunition, and he's, he's putting his hand out to Iran. He's currently right now in North Korea. And... Uh, what were frosty relationships in the past are now very much heating up and soon could be perceived as an alignment. And uh, Ann Applebaum, I think, is correct in, in, in that, uh, those statements of hers. So uh, I don't mind conservative movements as long as they're not fascist movements. And why do we have this frustration in the United States? Well, when you have a gridlock Congress, and when you have a president that's trying to govern through executive orders, uh, that's not good for anyone because all those executive orders are reversed the second a new president has come into office. So when you have gridlock in Congress, uh, you have a frustration. And that frustration is basically, you know, can take the form of many, many things, uh, social wedge issues such as mass shootings. Nothing's getting done about mass shootings. Um, Automatic weapons. Nothing is gained about automatic weapons in this country because Congress is gridlocked. Or you can look at the social, other social issues of, of unchecked immigration. Uh, a lot of people like to say illegal immigration. Again, nothing is being really uh, done about that because Congress is gridlocked. So when you have constant gridlock decade after decade, I think what occurs is a lack of faith in the government that is the predominant government, which is a, a republic a democracy, and people grow weary of, of things not getting done, so maybe they're open-minded to a little bit of a fascist now and then. Gene, what, you know, what about that? You know, we, uh, Kagan is one of my favorites, and he yeah. points out that, uh, you know, Trump is taking the same steps as in Mein Kampf um, to, to achieve power. And that means for him, it means move right in sort of a pathological way. Um, and so that, that's not necessarily conservative. It's not even fascism. It's um, authoritarianism. It's uh, ha Hannah Arendt totalitarianism, if you like. Uh, it's beyond anything that's happened in this country, both in concept and in numbers and in public support. Um, so query, how far right can we move without losing our democracy, our civil society? Can we be tolerant the way some people, some countries are in Europe? Or should we be more concerned? From what I've been learning in reprising some of the really great thinkers on the subject of authoritarianism, Anna Arendt, T.A. Adorno, the source materials they use from Nazi Germany, the current uh, major documentary based upon William Shirer, the chronicler of not the rise of Nazi Germany, the documentary on Netflix uh, of Hitler. Um, and the Nazis, uh, Evil on Trial, it's called, uh, an excellent documentary uh, everyone should watch today, with some asides as to its the, the, the prodromes in the MAGA movement toward fascism. But there are gradations of authoritarianism. There is 
such a thing as fascist movements. And we have them in this country. And I think Manfred just addressed that, actually. And I've been studying it for many years, too. But in addition to that, there are um, there's populism, there's authoritarianism, and there's totalitarianism. And in between somewhere, there's military dictatorship. And Hannah Arendt is very good about restricting totalitarianism to just two regimes, uh, Germany after Hitler was declared chancellor and uh, Stalin's reign in Soviet Russia. And she devotes her book, Origins of Totalitarianism, to that. But the main thing that I have learned from her is that the two ways to implant a fascism that moves toward totalitarianism is through two uh, rather calculated processes, propaganda and organization. And the first thing that the Nazis did after Hitler gained power uh, was to establish the Ministry of Propaganda under Joseph Goebbels and to um, tell the Germans they had to boycott Jewish businesses. And the Germans weren't there yet. They were more concerned about the economic situation of the Great Depression. So they had to back off. But by the time they consolidated themselves before the outbreak of war, the German people were in their camp, 100%. Um, because what Hitler did immediately was he organized, he reorganized society on the basis of a fictitious worldview that propaganda promoted, only one point of view, the Fuhrer's view, and then he showed how great that was uh, in, a, in, in opposition to democracy. I mean, they had the Olympics, they, they had um, uh, a youth fitness program, they had uh, every organization from the community level all the way up to the political level was governed by a unitary worldview that Hitler expounded and practiced and calculated in these speeches that he gave in these rallies. And this is very similar to Trump. I asked myself after Trump became president, why is this man who is now president with the bully pulpit, why is he still holding rallies? Well, if you listen to Trump, he's never talked about his political party. He's always talked about his political movement. And what he has done, he's taken the threads in our society of fascism that were existing and pre-existing, and he's brought them together under one banner. Make America Great Again, which depends upon the fictitious propagandistic worldview that we are in decline and that we are in chaos and that only he can fix it. And that's precisely what Hitler did. Yeah, and that's clear from uh, that, that docuseries you mentioned, uh, Hitler and the Nazis, um, uh, Evil on Trial. So, um, Manfred, let me let me go to you on this. It seems to me that even with all the move to the right um, in Europe, there's an essential difference um, between the right wing leaders. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but they are not trying to wreck whatever democracy exists in their country. And their countries are, you know, France, for example, it's still a democratic country. They have votes. They have snap votes, if you like. Um, and, and that's so for a, a lot of the EU. There's nobody challenges the level, the intensity of democracy in these countries. They don't want to throw it out with the best. But in this country, you have people, lots of people, including people in Congress, some people even on the courts who, who take a different view of it. They don't want the Constitution. They don't want the rule of law. They don't want democracy. Isn't that a significant difference between the U.S. and its current predicament and Europe? Yes, I think you're absolutely right. And I find it really fascinating that instead of talking about it, American intellectuals, including Gene, are focusing constantly on Nazi Germany, which collapsed 80 years ago. Uh, instead of talking about what is really uh, wrong at this point, and has been for a long, long time in this country. I mean, the white supremacy movement is a movement 
that has not gone away, but has become stronger. Uh, and uh, you do not have this kind, I think, of movement today in most European countries. You have anti-immigration or anti-immigration movements, uh, even though they are somewhat uh, tempered because uh, people understand they need uh, workers from non-European countries in order to fill the uh, the working class. Uh, I mean, you it be one million uh, Syrians that came and, and Afghanis that came in uh, 2015, they have become relatively well integrated in the German uh, labor force. Uh, so in that sense, uh, and when you're talking about uh, France, you know, you have to remember you have the, this, uh, it's not simply anti-migrants, it's anti-Muslims. Uh, so you have a religious dimension there in the hostility that uh, you have. Now you don't have that as expressive in, in Germany because you have in Germany, you know, two, if you want to, Muslim uh, community of the Turks, around three million of whom uh, half have become German citizens. The others don't want to become German citizens because they lose their pro property rights in, in Turkey. And then you have the recent immigrants, you know, the Syrians, the Afghanis and all kinds of other people who have come much later. Uh, the Turks have, in a way, contained this anti-Muslim sentiment in Germany, uh, even though you have again and again, you know, inc incidents uh, where you have uh, violence taking place. And uh, if, so in that sense, uh, you will always have that. But I think what American intellect, look, there was last Sunday in the New York Times, a long article, which I found really so, uh, strange. Uh, called Gen January 6, America's Rupture and the Strange Forgotten Power of Oblivion. Now, I did not, I mean, the article was in a way in praise of forgetting, you know, not uh, remembering. And I, when I read it, you know, I wondered why did the New York Times publish this, this piece in which the author, uh, I think she's a political uh, scientist of philosophy, I don't know where she is uh, located, why she praises forgetting instead of talking about processing memory, processing the past, dealing critically with the past. Not only the German past, that is, you know, uh, seems to be an article of faith in this country uh, to focus on Germany, but I think Robert Kagan is right in his new book, Anti-Liberalism, when he talks about the indigenous American uh, fascist tendencies connected under the heading of uh, white supremacy. Can I address something Manfred has stated Please. and I think Please. is important. Um, yeah. I, I, I think he, he makes a point that we do quote or we do cite uh, the beginning years of, of, of fascism in, in, in Germany, specific, specifically roughly 1933 through 1938. And we do so for a reason, or at least I do for, for, for a reason, because not that we have brown shirts in the street with clubs beating people or hauling them off to jail or work camps, concentration camps. We, we don't see that in America. But what I do see is a very, very close um, parallel to language to propaganda, yes. and, and, and Donald Trump's propaganda is very similar to the early years of the Hitler uh, regime, if you will. Um, Mark Twain said it best, Hist history does not repeat itself, but it often rhymes. And I see a whole lot of rhyming going on with Donald Trump and his abilities to mass persuade people, put them in a hypnotic uh, trance, if you will, create a cult-like environment and it is noteworthy, that's exactly what Hitler did. On what Manfred said. First of all, Manfred, I have been following the right, the ultra-right in this country since the 1990s. 
starting with uh, the Posse Comitatus in the 1970s. I actually traveled around the Northwest and talked to individuals who were combating the rise of, of Christian identity and white supremacism in their communities. Um, I trace it all the way back to the uh, post-Civil War Ku Klux Klan and then the resurgence of the Klan in the 1920s. Uh, I published a paper in uh, 2017 in the Journal of Terrorism and Political Violence that traced the dots uh, behind the MAGA movement to the whole uh, very minority, but very violent um, different organizations and factions in this country. Uh, in 2011, I wrote an introduction to um, the book of a former um, white nationalist anti-Semite anti um, and uh, said, if it ever happened in this country that the Christian evangelical movement, Christian, what we now call Christian nationalist movement, got together with the, uh, the, the fascist movement of the American Nazi Party and the Turner Diaries, uh, and they had a charismatic leader, we would be in big trouble because the Christian nationalists had the numbers, which the, right. the extremists could never gather because they were too extreme. But when you put that together with a very, very sophisticated uh, process of propagandizing and organizing, and I will tell you that already you'll see in today's paper, Roger Stone is talking about if the uh, outcome of this election is not what they want. They are prepared to jump in and to um, to examine the process and question the process and challenge the process, which has never, ever been done in this country before. So we are at a tipping point. And what I'm looking at with these great scholars on what happened in Germany is not that we are doing exactly what Nazi Germany did, or we're coming from the same ideology, but rather the process they're using and the instruments and tools they're, they're using to accomplish it. One thing you said I'd like to examine, Gene, and that is if, if we find that white Christian nationalism joins up with fascism, that's a, that's a witch's brew. But you, you've studied religion. That's part of your curriculum vitae. Um, so query, what, what is it about religion that makes that a witch's brew? Well, ultimate concern, man's search for meaning. Each of us needs something to hang on to, to find meaning in our world. And particularly young men, we found with the terrorism movements of jihadism. Uh, they feel, uh, which way am I going to go in life? How am I going to be a hero? Uh, what can I do for my community? They appeal to the idealism. Hitler did this with the Hitler youth. He, he organized them around helping people in the countryside. It was kind of a German Peace Corps. And uh, then it developed from there. So this sense of meaning, giving a sense of meaning. Once people inhabit that sense of meaning, it's not that they're brainwashed or that they're stupid. It's that they adhere to a fictitious worldview that gives them a sense that they are part of a community, their lives matter, they are working towards something larger than themselves. And if you even listen to what the Nazi officials had to say during the Nuremberg trials, they are saying, we did what was great for Germany. Hitler's, Himmler's last speech to the officials in that movie is chilling. He is saying that murder is what makes us glorious. That's the yeah. essence of it. And people believe it and they cannot they cannot exit from that. Yeah, I'd like to jump in because when you have an intersection of religion and politics, remember, um, a Christian nationalist movement, uh, evangelical movement. Great. You know, I, I, I'm not going to take sides with any particular religion. But remember, religion is an act of faith, not necessarily having to be proven by fact. It's a faith based driven organization. When you introduce that into politics, as a politician, no longer do I he need to evidence to prove my claims. I just need to have the faithful support me. And in this case, Donald Trump has a legion of faithful supporting him, regardless of his outrageous claims, his illogical uh, assumptions, because he doesn't need evidence any longer. 
He just has the faithful to support him. Yeah, and one thing is uh, of interest, to Manfred, is that uh, if you look at Europe today, um, people are not all that religious. Um, and I don't think that 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 card can be played. Um, they 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 do not follow cult religion, if religion at all. Am I right? Yes, and it's you know this topic is <clears throat> very interesting because my uh, mentor at the University of Munich, who emigrated in 1938 to the U.S. and was at LSU for uh, for 20 years before came to Munich in 1958. He published in 1938 an essay called Political Religions. And these political religions were Nazi, were National Socialism, and uh, the basis for the Soviet Union. And I think this dimension that didn't need uh, Christianity in support, the spiritual, the semi-spiritual meaning of these movements. No, they had this spiritual center in themselves. So you have political religious movements that uh, really dominated uh, during uh, the, well, the 30s, 40s, and 50s. They are not present today in Europe. Uh, now, whether you will get through this really amazing impact of the evangelicals in the United States uh, on the Trump movement, whether you will get something similar to what you had in Europe um, in the 30s and 40s. It, it's a very interesting question, but you're right. The religious dimension is absent from today's uh, right-wing parties in, in Europe. Okay, we're we're almost out of time, so I want to go around for summaries and closing comments. Jean, can we start with you? What would you like to leave with people about this very complex but important uh, set of issues? That we're rediscovering the wheel. That there was a great uh, sense among scholars uh, of all of all countries after World War II that they had to understand what had happened, and there's some great scholarship that's come out of that. But we haven't taught that. In our universities, we have not presented our students with that. We we have to rediscover it. Um, Eugene Hadamovsky is, is an unknown name, but he was second in command to Goebbels. He was a radio technician, and he was uh, really the man who uh, who created the whole process of propaganda in Germany. His book in translation, which is something like fifty seven pages, now costs three hundred and seventy five dollars. But I downloaded it free from the internet, and I'm reading it. And um, Arendt says he is the most brilliant uh, expositor of propaganda and how it is used to create a mindset. It's not, Arendt doesn't believe in brainwashing. My colleagues and I do not believe in brainwashing. Brainwashing is a simplistic idea, which we have to really examine and break down. It's how people believe what they believe, how they adhere to it, how they will um, consider it more important than life and death or anything else. They will die for it. And that's been the big question all along in my uh, scholarly career is what makes people go to the mat and die for something that's just quote unquote an idea. If you look at uh, Hadamovsky, if you look at Mussolini, when they talk about fascism, they use the word spiritual and soul. It's a false religion. And Paul Tillich knew this. He came out of Nazi Germany and he wrote the great book, Dynamics of Faith, in which he talked about ultimate concern. Instead of faith, we have ultimate concern. What is it that we put our faith in and we consider so important that we live by it and would even die for it? And in studying these small, bizarre groups that arise in the United States, like Jim Jones um, or uh, David Koresh, we have found how these things actually work in the smaller community and in CSA, which was a Christian survivalist group that became fascist and really was the genesis of the Oklahoma City bombing. And that's the one I wrote the introduction to. And so uh, what we're finding is that the same process occurs. This is in microcosm. I did not ever expect in my whole life to see a major political movement 
duplicating what happened at CSA and the things I had been studying for 20 years. I had hoped it would never happen and I thought it was improbable. Now it's with us and we have to contend with it. Wow. Manfred, your closing thoughts? It may not be brainwashing, but it's ignorance, historical ignorance. And that has to do with the educational system. I mean, Jean talked about it, that all of these issues are not dealt with in the universities and colleges today. Uh, so for that reason, <clears throat> I think uh, the lack of informed historical knowledge is stunning in this country, not only about uh, the United States itself and its history, but uh, about the world as a whole. So there you could say you have, uh, you can blame, you know, uh, the educational institutions for not being the kind of barrier that we need. But there's one issue for Hitler coming to power that we have, that one should mention. It is also the, the, the inability of the left in Germany in uh, the early 30s to unite. And that, uh, you know, the Social Democrats and the communists together with the liberals, they could have been the, the bulwark against uh, the Nazis. But uh, the Social Democrats did not want uh, to communicate with the communists. And the communists were under prohibition by Moscow from uh, dealing with the social democrats. So what you have there, and the, the, the Nazis, you know, when they came to power, the first thing they did was uh, create concentration camps in which they uh, put uh, all the communists and the social democrats and the leaders of, social, uh, of uh, trade unions that they could uh, identify. They were the initial targets. Jews were not the initial targets. There were some Jews among them that were arrested. But it was the political left that was arrested and in a way uh, disarmed uh, in yeah. after 30th of January. Watch out. Watch out in November. So <clears throat> your, your, your final thoughts, Tim. See if you can put all this together. Oh. <clears throat> Thanks, Jay. <laughs> uh, you know, um, conservatism is, is a is a definition that should not be feared. Uh, conservatism is an idea and principles that should not be feared, and it's not to be should not be uh, connected with something bad. As is progressivism should not be feared for its ideals and and, and principles. The problem is when we take these terms and use them as weapons to instill fear in the populace. And that's what's taking place on both sides. Uh, we're taking neutral words and we're trying to twist them around to give a negative connotation to the voting public. I do not fear conservatism, but I do can fear, I fear conservatism when the flag of conservatism is being waved in an effort to consolidate power for any one individual or administration. That is which is to be feared. That is which is fascism. Wow. Cutting edge, all of it. Thank you very much, uh, Tim Apicella, Gene Rosenfeld, Manfred Henningsen. Thank you so much for this conversation. We learned so much. We are at the cutting edge. Aloha. <laughs>